Did you ever get any money from any other person whom we might call a gangster other than Siegel? No. Uh, did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. All snakeheads Cheng Chui Ping dies in prison. 21 years ago, snakehead Cheng Chui Ping smuggled nearly 300 starving immigrants into New York from China on rusty cargo ship the Golden Venture. Decades, organized crime has predominantly been depicted as a male-dominated underworld, but history reveals a different narrative, one where women have carved out powerful and fearsome roles. In a world where brutality and cunning are often essential for survival, these gang queens defy traditional expectations and rule their empires with remarkable authority. Figures like Maria Chata Leon and Stephanie Sinclair not only commanded fear and respect in their territories, but also demonstrated that power in the criminal underworld could be wielded with a distinctly female form of influence. From orchestrating major drug operations to controlling illegal gambling networks, these women left an indelible mark on organized crime, contributing to its evolving history and underscoring the complexities of power, loyalty, and survival. Maria Chata Leon is a notorious figure in organized crime with a major influence stretching from Mexico to Southern California. Known as one of the few powerful female leaders in the Mexican drug underworld, Leon led a vast drug trafficking network from her base in Los Angeles, orchestrating a ruthless criminal enterprise that employed violent tactics to secure control over her territories. Born in Mexico, Leon immigrated to the U.S. as a young woman, quickly establishing a criminal network that grew around her family particularly her sons and relatives. Based in Northeast Los Angeles' Glassell Park, Leon's organization was closely linked with the Avenues gang, providing her both protection and distribution power. Her control of the local drug trade was reinforced by her relationships with Mexican cartels, allowing her to consistently smuggle large quantities of drugs into the U.S., contributing to the drug epidemic in Los Angeles. Her dominance, however, came to an end in 2008 when the Los Angeles Police Department and federal agencies launched Operation Tijuana Flats. The intense investigation, involving extensive surveillance, led to raids on Leon's properties and the arrest of her family members, including Maria herself. She faced multiple charges related to drug trafficking, money laundering, and violent crimes. Ultimately, Leon was convicted and sentenced to federal prison, dismantling her criminal empire and temporarily reducing gang violence in her territories. Although Leon's influence waned following her conviction, her legacy remains a significant chapter in the history of organized crime in Los Angeles. Wondering, did you ever get any money from any other person whom we might call a gangster other than Siegel? No. Uh, did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. And uh, did you ever uh, get any money from Maya Lansky? I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those none fellas. None of those fellas. None of, the, uh, none none of these that I've been reading about, or none that I knew, they never gave me anything. None of the Fichettes? No. You I don't even speak to them. I, I mean, I met that Charlie once or twice. I don't even talk to him. You don't like him? No. <laughs> Do you still bet the horse races? That's the only thing I... Now? Uh -huh. I wouldn't... I don't bet anything. Now I'm afraid I'll win, and then they'll say I made more money than I did. <laughs> Virginia Hill, also known as the Queen of the Mob, reached unprecedented heights in America's organized crime world from the 1930s to the late 1940s. Known for her charm and resilience, she worked with powerful mobsters, including Charles Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and Bugsy Siegel, acting as a money launderer, cash courier, and informant. She even handled drug deals in Mexico, using her allure to secure deals for the syndicate. Hill's relationship with Siegel, beginning around 1937, was tumultuous. In the 1940s, she joined him in Las Vegas, where he launched the Flamingo Hotel project with mob backing. However, Siegel's lavish spending angered his partners, who suspected he was hiding funds through Hill. When she was sent to Paris, Siegel was assassinated in their Beverly Hills home in 1947, a likely syndicate-ordered hit. The high-profile nature of her connections attracted IR's attention, leading to tax evasion investigations in the late 1940s. After marrying Austrian skiing champion Hans Hauser and having a son, she was forced to testify about the syndicate in 1951 before the Senate's Kefauver Committee making her infamous nationwide. By the 1960s, Hill was reportedly struggling financially and emotionally, 
and in 1966, she passed away in Austria from an apparent overdose, likely a suicide. Her life remains one of the most notorious stories in American organized crime history. 21 years ago, snakehead Cheng Chui Ping smuggled nearly 300 starving immigrants into New York from China on rusty cargo ship the Golden Venture. The ship ran aground Rockaway Beach in Queens, and 10 passengers drowned while attempting to flee. Cheng Chu Ping, famously known as Sister Ping or the Snakehead, earned her place in history as a powerful human smuggler who led an underground network in New York's Chinatown. Over the 1980s and 90s, she trafficked around 3,000 people from her native China to the U.S., charging each up to $40,000 and amassing a fortune of $40 million. During her peak, Sister Ping financed perilous journeys across continents, moving people from Hong Kong to Guatemala and onward to New York. In 1993, the Golden Venture, a dilapidated cargo ship she supported, ran aground off Queens, New York after a grueling 100-day journey. Ten people died trying to swim ashore. Another ship she financed capsized near Guatemala, claiming 14 lives. Despite her infamy, many in New York's Chinatown regarded Sister Ping as a supportive figure, helping immigrants from Fujian province settle in the U.S., loaning money and securing jobs. But law enforcement saw a different side. Sister Ping was also known for her ruthless collection tactics, enlisting the Qin Gang to enforce payments from clients. Born in Fujian in 1949, Sister Ping arrived in the U.S. illegally in 1981, setting up a business that soon expanded to a large-scale human smuggling operation. She developed a secretive banking system, allowing clients to send funds back to China, and took in profits through a 30% interest rate on loans to those needing her smuggling services. Her operation flourished, using fake documents, bribes, and complex routes through Central America. In 1989, the FBI uncovered her enterprise, but after serving a brief prison sentence, she resumed smuggling, leveraging the increased demand following the Tiananmen Square protests. Her business grew to include real estate, restaurants, and a travel agency in Chinatown. However, her partnership with local gang leader Ah K raised suspicion, and in 1994, a grand jury indicted her. After fleeing to China, she was extradited to the U.S. in 2003. In her 2006 trial, prosecutors presented testimony from witnesses worldwide. Though she denied all charges, the court sentenced her to 35 years for smuggling, money laundering, and trafficking. She passed away in prison in 2014 at age 65, leaving behind a legacy both feared and revered in Chinatown. In December 1930, Stephanie St. Clair, also known as the Queen of Harlem's illegal numbers racket, boldly testified in a New York court about the bribes she paid to police officers to protect her operation. Dressed in a lavish fur coat and claw hat, St. Clair commanded attention as she described her payments to vice officers who allegedly shielded her workers from arrest until they double-crossed her. This testimony, emblematic of Prohibition-era corruption, highlighted how police had exploited Harlem's numbers game, taking bribes while still targeting her operation. St. Clair, a French-speaking immigrant from Martinique, had risen to power in the 1920s by controlling a significant share of Harlem's numbers racket. With bets based on three-digit numbers and odds of 1,000 to 1, her operation thrived, generating substantial income and local jobs. By 1930, St. Clair was reportedly worth $300,000, around $4.3 million today, living in one of Harlem's most prestigious buildings. However, as Prohibition neared its end in the early 1930s, mobster Dutch Schultz sought to take over Harlem's numbers game, seeing it as a lucrative new venture. While other bankers complied with his demands, St. Clair resisted. Schultz retaliated by terrorizing her employees and taking over rival operations. Undeterred, St. Clair called out Schultz's tactics publicly and even reportedly shattered windows of businesses in Harlem that collaborated with him. In the end, Schultz's intimidation wore her down and she surrendered her territory. Despite losing her numbers empire, St. Clair had the final word after Schultz's 1935 assassination, allegedly sending him a pointed telegram that read, As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Following Schultz's demise, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson, one of St. Clair's former associates, took over Harlem's numbers racket under Luciano's Mafia family. St. Clair's influence faded, though her legacy as a formidable figure in Harlem's underworld endures. She passed away in 1968, the same year Johnson passed away, marking the end of an era in Harlem's storied history. Got together and planned a mission to get revenge. Yeah. You guys got a 25 caliber pistol. Yeah. Oh, originally the plan was to do a drive-by. Yeah. 
Jacqueline Montanez, known as Loca D, is one of the few women in the U.S. sentenced to life without parole for crimes committed as a juvenile. Her story has stirred debate on gang violence, youth sentencing, and the potential for rehabilitation. Growing up in Chicago's Humboldt Park, Montanez faced poverty, violence, and a difficult family life marked by abuse. By her early teens, she joined the Maniac Latin Disciples Gang. At 15, Montanez and two friends lured and deleted two members of the rival Latin Kings in a calculated act of gang loyalty. Tried as an adult, she received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Over time, however, Montanez transformed behind bars. She earned her GD, met her younger inmates, and became an advocate for prison reform and restorative justice. Her story has since become a touchstone for juvenile justice reform, especially following the 2012 Supreme Court ruling in Miller v. Alabama, which deemed mandatory life sentences without parole for juveniles unconstitutional. Her story highlights the complex realities of gang life, early trauma, and the potential for change, even after profound mistakes. These women may have wielded influence in very different regions and through distinct criminal enterprises, but they share common threads, resilience, resourcefulness, and the drive to dominate an unforgiving world. Although each of these crime queens met a different fate, whether imprisonment, exile, or a violent demise, their legacies endure as reminders of both the allure and peril of a life lived on the edge of society. In an environment that is often unforgiving and perilous, these women forge paths that reshape the boundaries of power and influence within the criminal underworld. The stories serve as cautionary tales and intriguing glimpses into a world where loyalty, betrayal, and ambition often meant life or death, leaving behind a dark but compelling legacy in the annals of crime.